Okay, here we are again. We're talking about joints. Um, and we're starting to really chew on uh, how um, the structure and function in our science studies influences and overlaps uh, into our massage application. So let's share our little screen. And now we're going to talk more about the motion. And there's some pretty big words in here to uh, get a sense of. But where this is going to fit for us is how we assess motion um, and, and how we are starting to think about what our plan is going to be. Uh, so do enjoy the birds in the background here. So we've got arthrokinematic movement and osteokinematic movement. The osteokinematic movement is what we can make happen. That's our flexion, extension, et cetera, et cetera, that happens in the various planes that we described in chapter one. Um, but just like a hinge, there's a pin inside a hinge that's got to spin. So there's got to be space in the joint for this movement to occur for the one bone to move on the other. Um, and there's a little bit of play in there, a little slop in there. And that's where your arthrokinematic movement is. So um, there are various tricks to separate these. This, this is difficult for me with the way my brain works. Um, these words are really similar. I never totally trust that I've got the right term with the right definition here. Um, and so um, I have little tricks inside my head that help me remember that and they may or may not work for you but i know that there's two terms here that are important and if i remember one like the arthro which makes me think of a joint and then how everything has to fit together in there um, that sometimes helps me remember that this is non-voluntary movement within a joint, but that movement has to happen as part of the motion. Maybe you can come up with a better one, um, but don't be surprised if I get these words mixed up. So if you know I have done that, you need to correct me. Okay, so now we've got some terms that describe that. Inside that joint capsule, those two bones that are there, sometimes there's three, but usually two, uh, they need to roll, they need to slide, and they need to spin. And, and that movement has to occur. Sometimes this can get the change of the location of the two bones, the orientation of the two bones is going to interfere. So here, it, this can't spin, and then that's going to uh, send sensory data into the nervous system to the mechanoreceptors in there and say, hey, something's wrong. And typically what happens is, is when something is wrong, everything stiffens up. Um, and so you will get a limit in range of motion related to that. Okay. So that little bit of movement in there is called joint play. Um, and uh, sometimes we can, as we are doing massage, if we can loosen up temporarily, soften up the structures around a joint and then a person moves that joint, they can restore their own joint play. Uh, I wonder if various types of joint manipulation like a chiropractor might do or a physical therapist or an osteopath. I sometimes wonder if that's not 
targeting the how one bone is oriented related to another and, and then allows for more freedom of movement. Um, so then we have the osteokinematic movement and, and that's where there are uh, there's active ability to move the joint. All right. So um, you have to have the right joint play in order for this to function <clears throat> the very best it can. Um, and there are limits of range there. So at the very end range, which is the anatomical range, uh, if it goes any further than that, there could actually be damage to the structures around the joint. So we typically have what's called a physiological range where the receptors around the joint um, in the connective tissue signal, well, oh, oh, careful, careful, you're getting close to the end range here because if you get to end range, then the anatomical range, you go any further than that, then there's gonna be some damage or pinching or something. Um, so we rarely get, our body protects us, we rarely get to our full anatomical range. And then if there's been an injury to the joint or if there's deterioration to the joint or there has been some sort of neural uh, dysfunction, then we'll have a pathological range of motion change. And the two that are most common with that is hypomobility and hypermobility. And we've talked about that a little bit already when we were talking about laxity. So underlying joint laxity can um, assess as hypomobility because the structures around the joint have stiffened or the tone is increasing the muscles to provide stability. Um, if we don't understand that there might be hypermobility uh, under that, laxity in the joint under that, we can, massage can temporarily um, have a pretty good effect on decreasing stiffness and reducing this hypomobility. Um, but when that happens, the stability is disturbed. And so the underlying hypermobility um, is exposed and the person might actually uh, leave the massage feeling great and then wake up feeling terrible the next day um, it, because the, the balance between the stability and mobility has been disturbed. So we have to kind of watch that when we're doing massage. Um, the other thing that we have as we assess for movement is what does it feel like at the end range? And mostly we should feel a soft end feel. Um, so that there's, there's a pain-free, pain, let me find a joint pain-free movement and when we get so the active movement and then the passive movement and then when we get to the end of it in a soft end feel there's just a little bit more non painful give and we're talking really little um, and that's a soft end feel. Now, a bony or hard end feel, we have a couple of those where um, it is normal, like our elbow, the way the bone is shaped. Um, this little electron process goes right into a fossa, boom, done. 
And the elbow in and of itself is, is a pretty stable joint because of that, even though it's got quite a lot of range of motion with it. But when you bring it out, you'll, you'll hear that stop or you'll feel that stop. There's one in your ankle as well. But typically, a bony or hard end feel is indication that there's something going on in the joint. Um, if it is bindy, um, kind of bounces back at you a lot and is uh, painful or uh, odd for the person to move or to have you move it, then it might have something called a capsular infill. This is also uh, pathological as well as a, uh, an empty infill. And the, the two that we work with the most are this soft end feel, which we mostly should see within a normal range uh, and uh, awareness that a bony or hard end feel would be certainly an indication for referral. Um, now, sometimes range of motion is limited just because the soft tissues around it limit. So, you know, I've got some tissue here that bumps into itself before the joint actually could, maybe the joint could go a little bit further, but it's stopped because I have got um, some tissue bumping into tissue. And we, we need to be careful to not uh, identify that as a, a problem with range of motion. It's a problem with the, the external with the tissue. Uh, clothing actually can inhibit this too. You know, so people might have a limited range of motion, but it's from an external reason. Then we have uh, how the bones actually fit together and uh, when they are in close approximation to each other and there's a lot of surface contact, that's called closed pack. And when there is, and that's the most stable. And when there is less approximation, less connection in there, that's called loose pack. Um, and an easy way to determine what that is. I mean, there's charts in here that are going to tell you what it is. Uh, but an easy way to do that is to assess for the end range. We're going to look at my wrist. And so at either end of the range is a closed packed position. And right in the middle of that is a loose packed position. And this is where there's the most mobility um but also the least stability so okay that'll become important uh, with some techniques that you're going to learn later on all right uh, i gotta get the screen over here so now now we're wrapping back around to chapter one and the cardinal planes and also described in chapter three um, with that level of terminology and so we've got uh, frontal also called coronal let's have multiple names for the same thing uh, before we move into that here is the least packed positions of the joints that's what I was telling you take it to either end which are your closed packed take it right into the middle that's your loose pack or least pack of your joints. So this kind of tells you where that's at. And then here's the table that explains the uh, closed pack, the most stable. These are important to know. This is where the joint has got the most potential for direct injury to the joint structures. And here in the least pack positions, they're most vulnerable to sprains and strains and that sort of thing. Okay, back to planes of motion. So frontal plane, 
uh, the sagittal plane um, and the movements that the joints can perform are related to these planes. And then we have the horizontal or transverse plane. So in the frontal plane, we have abductions and adductions. And in the sagittal plane, we have flexions and extensions. And in the horizontal or transverse plane, we have rotations, medial rotation or internal rotation, and lateral rotation or external rotation. So, overlapping information. Um, and again, that's going to be come the this understanding we're going to be building and building and building on this as we're talking about uh, functional movement. So now we've got a classification system just for synovial joints or freely moving joints. Um, and again, this box is going to reinforce those movements for you. Um, so do pay attention to that. Here's something on uh, counter nutation, nutation, and neutral position has to do with the sacrum and the coccyx. Uh, so we have a uniaxial axial joint, una one, which means that it just moves in one plane of motion. So we have a hinge joint. Uh, elbow is an example. We have a pivot joint. Um, we don't have very many of those. Um, we have one up here at the, at the cervical area. And then we have biaxial. That means they can move in two planes. So a hinge joint only moves in the sagittal plane, and a pivot joint only moves in the transverse plane. M most joints are more biaxial, uh, which means they can move in two planes. Um, and so we have a congular joint. So, so that means that it can I'm looking in the video here. Here we go. It means that this joint can move like this, but maybe like this too. Mostly it might be a hinge joint, but maybe it's got a little bit of back and forth movement in it that could uh, have a little bit of abduction and adduction to it. Uh, typical for that is the saddle joint of the thumb. And that's why it can't be used for massage because it's, you can't stabilize it. And I don't, I don't care how you try to do that, that joint is inherently lax. So uh, we really need to avoid the use of our thumbs when we're doing massage. You, you will hurt yourself if you do that. And then we have triaxial joints that can move in all of the planes of motion. So these are typically your ball and socket, like your shoulder. So you can flex and extend, and you can adduct and abduct, and you can internally and externally rotate. You can do the same at your hip. Um, so uh, that those joints, uh, inherently have a lot of wear and tear and they're typically located where the appendicular skeleton is going to join on to the axial skeleton. And then you have some um, gliding joints that can move like this and we have a, we have a few of those. Um, one of the ones that uh, often will um, show up is the acromioclavicular joint here and it'll limit shoulder movement. It's, it's got to have a little bit of slide in it. Um, so uh, then we have the joints, I never have been able to pronounce this, zygofacial joint. So you know what you do with that? 
you copy it and then you put it into a, a glossary type program and it'll pronounce it for you. Um, I have not heard the read to you feature try to pronounce that word. <laughs> but it's where the, the vertebrae, like Legos, stack one on top of the other. And then another concept with all of this is that joints move in functional patterns. Uh, rarely do you have one joint that is moving independently of others. Uh, it is always a, a full body type of movement when um, we are trying to um, walk, for example, or to run or to bend over or whatever. So we, uh, the, the series of pictures you've got here is we, we've got to um, be able to do, a, at the very least, an eyeball measurement um, of the amount of movement here. And um, I'm going to uh, slow this down. Let me decrease the size here a little bit. Uh, there are real precision movements that occur with this, uh, or measurements, and I, I'm not gonna um, expect you to, to know that specifically in terms of range, um, but in general, uh, we can make some functional movement assumptions. So if it, if it is a hinge joint, so here, here is, do we have a knee here? So here's a knee. Um, if it is a hinge joint uh, and we are looking at what functional movement would be. And this is functioning on the sagittal plane. So flexion, so the joint angle is decreasing. Flexion in a hinge joint is 90 degrees, comes across right through here, and a little. So my finger here, that's a hinge joint. So this should be able to flex 90 degrees and just a little. And then it extends back out based on anatomical position. So this would be zero. So um, it goes out to zero and any extension that could be involved would be 15 degrees or less. So um, here, when we're looking at this picture right here, we've got a 90 degree hip flexion. So that's a ball and socket joint functioning on the sagittal plane. And here we have got a measurement of hip extension which is giving the maximal range at 20 degrees. Um, but it, very workable is selections are 90 and a little, and extensions are from zero to 15. And then we have abductions and adductions. So this is an example of an adduction measurement. Uh, I don't know if there's an abduction one here, close or not. Um, so, um, hi. So, adduction towards the midline, abduction goes away from the midline. So, abduction is about 45 degrees to away from the midline to zero. 45 degrees away to zero. 
And same with your rotations. They typically are uh, a 45 degree. We can see this in here. This is internal rotation. It can move away from the midline here. And then when it comes back, it's zero. And then if it went into external rotation, it would be about the same. All righty, an activity, you know what to do with that. Now we're gonna discuss a little bit about a, what a closed kinematic chain is and, and an open kinematic chain. So um, a good way to illustrate this is for you to stand up straight in the anatomical position and then attempt to bend your knee without moving your ankle or your hip. And because your foot is fixed, it's closed, that whole group of, uh, of uh, joints cannot function independently. Each one has to move a little bit. But if you open that and you sit back down and you get your foot off of the ground, then you can swing your knee back and forth without necessarily moving the hip or the ankle. So closed kinematic chains are more stable. You know, we have a, there's a, a protective mechanism there. Each joint moves a little as opposed to one joint moving a lot. And an open kinematic chain allows maximal movement of an individual joint. Now, this is important when we are thinking about assessment and or we're doing joint movement with a client. When a client's laying on the table, everything is open chain. So that means that we can over move a joint if we're not cautious. And so that goes back to um, flexions and extensions, typically with hinge joints, uh, 90 and a little for flexion and zero, no more than 15. Zero would be your extension, and then beyond that would be your hyper extension. Shoulders got a little bit more play. It can go further than 15 degrees, but it doesn't need to, unless there's some sort of performance demand where somebody wants it to so that they can throw a ball or, or whatever, swing a golf club or, or whatever. Um, and so we can over, easily overdo it uh, if we're not considering this integrated stacked movement. Um, same with abductions and adductions at that 45, start at zero, go out 45 and come back. Um, and then our rotation. So here's some pictures of the particular joints. Um, and uh, I had just said that the knee was a hinge joint. It, it's a little bit more complex than that. It's got the ability to move by, by axle. Um, so uh, right here, you start to see where there's, you know, there's some of these joints are located and the generalized shape of them. So lots of language here, lots of functional understanding. You're gonna wanna make good use of the YouTube videos that go with this and even explore and find more. If you find a really good one, post it for us on Canvas so that we can all you know, get what help we need to understand this. Okay, the next section we're gonna get into, I'm gonna to try to get into, here we go, um, is the uh, unique to this textbook for you as each individual joint, and I'm not gonna go through these and explain all these to you because it's very self-explanatory. Um, so the features of it are the joints, an overview of an area, um, let me get this bigger so that I can read it. Um, 
a description, and then detailed information on how to palpate it. And this is what you would do. You would place your fingers on your eyebrows and then firmly slide them up your forehead to the top of your skull where you feel the first indentation. All right. Um, this is something. This is the coronal suture. All right. Pressing your fingers firmly into that suture, follow the indentation down on either side. Top of your ear, I think is what it says here. And the eye. Okay. And then behind the ear, so behind the ear, just above the mastoid process, a bony landmark, palpate the indentation that moves in an arc superiorly and posteriorly. Okay. And then at the midpoint, then we've got um, of the lambdoidal suture, then we have got the indentation that goes along the middle um, and joins with the coronal suture. This is the sagittal suture. All right, and then I'm gonna to wanna to do that more and more time. So uh, now my hair looks great. Um, so we're gonna palpate those. So here's another joint. Here is the temporal mandibular joint. So it has articulating bones, the temporal bone and the mandible. So the joint type is synovial, which means it moves a lot, and it's a hinge, so it's, up and down, it's moving in the sagittal plane. It's got some ligaments on it, and here are the main ones. Um, and then it gives you a little bit of information about it. Um, now, again, the way the book's laid out, here are your uh, pictures of your, your uh, frontal, or your cranial sutures that we just palpated. Let's get through here and find the picture of the Temporal mandibular joint. Here it is. Um, so uh, we're going to start to uh, palpate there, and you've got a picture. And so um, it says palpate the joint just in front of each ear. So I've got the bones, and I'm in front of my ear. Um, and it is going to tell me to open and close my mouth. So I should be able to find these five movements. So depression, elevation, protraction, retraction. Okay. And you can feel what happens with a joint. All right, so this is how you do this. And then you find another person and you palpate the joints on them going through this in detail. And this goes on and on and on. Okay. So this is a doing, you know, get your hands on and do it. It's a little bit more complex when we get into the pelvis a little bit uh, and understanding those various joints and the sacroiliac joint, that one's right here, that's pretty complicated. Have a general idea of the main ligaments in the area. 
um, stop and palpate and say out loud the structures. Right here, we're moving out of the appendicular skeleton now back into the axial. So again, touch, touch and palpate, move, move it if it's will move. So this becomes parts and function as we go through here. So beginning just below the skull, palpate the spinous process of the cervical vertebrae. I think of a, the, a, a dorsal fin of a fish in here. Um, can't really do C1, C2, you know, that, that's kind of indented there, but you can start to feel C2 through 3, 7. And C7 and T1, that's, you, can, you can feel that in there. Um, and then continue along as far as you can to get a sense of that. Um, and feel the bony prominences of either side, which are your transverse process. And then, you know, when you get down to um, the end where your iliac spine is, uh, you can palpate um, the area right there where L4, L5 becomes a good reference point for that. And then uh, move and rotate, rotate your spine and feel what happens with that. Now the skeleton that I'm strongly suggesting you get, you can also do this on the skeletons. Um, and uh, when you get, are in the classroom, I move those skeletons around a lot so that you can see it. And that's why they're broken. <laughs> so, all right, there we go. And um, as you are also practicing massage techniques, be aware of what you're touching. Find those bony landmarks, move it around, talk the language over and over, or you're not going to integrate it. And this last section then is how we are going to, in the classroom, integrate this information into uh, our actual massage. So, um, and we've got our normal range of motion here um, that I have, um, made more simple with the 90 flexion, 15 extension, hyperextensions, uh, 45s for internal and external rotations and adduction and abductions. But you can see that it's a little bit more complicated than that. And then as you are assessing, now we're starting to do some doing. So in the classroom, this is where we would look at this chapter and start to move these joints and, and make some determination about what we're feeling with an end feel and um, so we we will use different kinds of joint movement so range of motion is the finding how we find it is through joint movement which either can be active the person's doing it or passive we're doing it. And then there's a little bit, you know, you can have active assisted and active resisted and, and uh, those will uh, be varying degrees between the two. So um, this is also going to pair up with the biomechanics chapter in the fundamentals book. Uh, as well, and it's chapter 11. So here's our section summary. And finally, we're going to get into our pathological conditions. 
Um, and so because this is part of the uh, muscle skeletal uh, structure that people will be able to identify, oh, it hurts when I do this idea, these are more common, we encounter these. And I, I, I promise you that I can never keep what's golfer's elbow and what's tennis elbow or pitcher's elbow. Um, but they, they are different. <laughs> so it's inflammation around the uh, condyles. See how the language is building on itself. And then we've got arthritis, which is active inflammation. Um, but most of what we call arthritis is osteo or degenerative joint disease. And the uh, ultimate treatment of this or the end stage treatment of this might be a joint replacement. They're really coming along with some things that they can do with that's not as aggressive as actually replacing the joint, but they can and, and that's, that's really helpful. Uh, you're likely to have a client that has had a knee or a hip replaced. Um, now, rheumatoid arthritis is a immune, autoimmune condition, and it is ongoing inflammation. And so we have to be a little uh, more understanding of the treatments that are used for that. So then there's gout. Uh, which is crystal-induced arthritis. You've probably heard people complaining about gout, but massage is contraindicated over a gouty joint because there are actual little particles in there that uh, are pressing out. And if we press in, um, we can increase some potential for some actual damage inside. And then there's infectious inflammation of a joint. Um, and tuberculosis, again, is the most common for that. And then we have our different injuries um, and the different levels of sprain. So um, and this is some ideas about how you can determine what that is. So a first degree sprain it may hurt a lot and it may really swell, but they can stand on it and they can move it around or they can press with it if it's up in the wrist. Second degree, they're gonna, there's more damage um, and they're gonna limp, they're gonna wanna protect. And third degree is pretty bad. They're not gonna wanna put any compression into that joint at all. Um, these are acute injuries. Um, and kind of the best thing to do with an acute injury is uh, follow generalized first aid treatment or what the doctor or the athletic trainer or whatever says about it and just stay away from the area. Um, and then as it moves from its acute phase into the subacute and into the remodeling phase, then massage can help support more normal healing and function. Uh, joints are made to move, so if they're immobilized, um, it can cause dysfunction. So there's swelling around a joint, which is more edema, and swelling inside the joint that is a fusion, and, and it is like a water balloon. And Massage may be able to temporarily move external fluid, but probably not um, very good at dealing with the effusion. A um, lot of people have problems with the TMJs. Uh, there's been some pseudoscience around in treating that. Um, there are specific classes that you can take that will target working on that joint area. Um, I get a little nervous when we start isolating areas too much because I know that this part affects that part, which affects the other. Um, 
but it is a common area uh, of dysfunction. And then um, we have uh, paralysis, which is not necessarily a joint disorder, but the lack of movement will cause the area to stiffen, and we may be able to help with that a little bit. Um, adhesive capsulitis. There is a lot of people that say that they are dealing with that. If it truly is a frozen shoulder, um, it, it's its own pathology. Uh, it usually uh, resolves on its own um, and work the area around um, and don't get too caught up on trying to reverse this. If you can help them move a little bit better, it will help this. So these are your spinal curves. Um, this is your backache. Most of the backache does not happen from the joint alignment. It can happen from the mechanical, mechanoreceptors in there, laxity, which is common, um, and then the structures that tighten up to try to um, provide stability, especially something called the lumbar dorsal fascia. You're gonna have little outgrowths, ganglia, and no, don't hit them with a book. Um, so it's a, it's a increased a cavity fills, a, 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 like think of saran wrap with a bubble in it, fills up with fluid, uh, jelly, more jelly-like fluid. And they can interfere with um, movement in an area, and then if that's the case, they might need to be removed. Here are some surgeries uh, and other uh, treatment. Um, stem cell is becoming more and more popular. You might want to get on to uh, PubMed and read more about that, as is the platelet-rich rich plasma. I've worked with athletes that have had these procedures done um, pretty successful. And the same with actual injections into the joint. The Hyralon type substances really have been helpful in my experience. All right, here's our summary on this content. And we know about our critical thinking and where to find the um, responses, the author responses for that. And you've done enough of these now that for the joint, I would suggest you try to write one and on your own and that uh, we can share those with each other because uh, this is kind of a, a real crossover uh, chapter in this unit where we're starting to really see specific applications uh, for massage with this. So use this as a model and, and practice writing one yourself. And then you know all of the stuff that's on the Evolve site for you that we have already posted to Canvas and what to do with all of these questions. Um, so you're beginning to be very experienced with this now. And uh, you can use the two videos for this chapter to guide how you're gonna go through this. This is, this is gonna take some time. Um, you're not going to be able to read this once, you know, so you're going to have to have repetition and go over and over and over with this. And then the next chapter now will be about the muscles and that there's a lot to, to look at there. Um, I'm not going to describe individual muscles in these videos. Um, I might do uh, some separate uh, chats about common overlapping conditions we find between functional movement and, and muscle functional groups. We might do some of that, um, but it's going to be your job 
just like it is for everything in this book pretty much and you're going to have to digest the pieces and the parts and the generalized concepts of function and then we'll teach you how to use that as a massage therapist.